Transfusions are so ingrained in clinical practice that in many clinical situations, a significant number are given to alleviate physicians' discomfort rather than care for the patient's needs. Transfusion practice is based on behavior rather than evidence. We really must change transfusion medicine practice. There is no other alternative and there is a sense of urgency. This change will be from a product focus to a patient focus. And this is what we're referring to as patient blood management. In 2006, Tinmouth and colleagues analyzed the association between red blood cell transfusions and increased mortality and morbidity in the critically ill. They wrote, we have witnessed a dramatic paradigm shift whereby red blood cell transfusions, once regarded as one of the great advances in modern medicine, are now considered harmful in some clinical situations. In 42 of the 45 studies that Marek and Corwin reviewed in 2008, they found the risk of red cell transfusion outweighed the benefits. The risk was neutral in two studies, and the benefits outweighed the risks in only a subgroup of one study. They concluded, our analysis suggests that in adults, intensive care unit, trauma and surgical patients, red blood cell transfusions are associated with increased morbidity and mortality, and therefore current transfusion practices may require re-evaluation. In 2009, the first international consensus conference on transfusion outcomes considered the benefits of transfusions across a total of 495 studies. The findings indicated that in 59% of clinical scenarios, transfusions were not beneficial at all. In 29% of the cases, it was uncertain whether these transfusions were beneficial. It was only in 12% of this population that transfusions were deemed to be helpful. Blood is a complex biological fluid a great deal of work has been done to understand the multiple biochemical and biomechanical changes that take place once it is removed from its host and stored. However, the possible clinical implications of transfusing this stored biological product are only beginning to be better understood. Dr. Andreas Meyer-Hellmann and colleagues from the Helios Clinic Erfurt, Germany used a cytoscan to film the sublingual microcirculation pre- and post-transfusion in a patient with severe gastrointestinal bleeding. The patient's hemoglobin fell to 2.8 grams per deciliter. This video shows the microcirculation after initial resuscitation with an acellular volume expander. What red blood cells are left are circulating through all the multi-cell and single-cell capillaries. The next video shows the same microcirculation after the transfusion of three units of stored allogeneic red blood cells. Clearly, here there is reduced flow. Single cell capillaries are swollen. There is uneven distribution of the red cells, blockage and sludging, and many areas where there are no red blood cells in contact with the tissues. This work starts to provide insights into the possible mechanisms underlying the limited evidence for transfusion efficacy. As clinicians, we have learned three key lessons. First, even the most profound anemia can be sustainably and quickly corrected without utilizing allogeneic blood products. Second, Perioperative blood loss, even in complex procedures, can be significantly reduced. And third, postoperative treatment of asymptomatic anemia should be applied universally to sufficiently restore the patient's endogenous red cell volume. It really is a sobering thought when one considers that allogeneic blood transfusion has the potential for a wider range of adverse clinical outcomes than probably any other medical intervention. After considering all available evidence on transfusion and outcome, we are left with the conclusion that transfusion is a major multiplier of morbidity and mortality. Maintaining the status quo, as we see in transfusion practice today, would just not be accepted 
or tolerated in any other field of medicine in the context of current safety and quality standards.